Good morning, everyone. It is a, a pleasure to welcome uh, the NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg, Jens, my friend and colleague, uh, back here to the State <coughs> Department and to, to Washington. Uh, we've seen each other quite a bit over the last 15 months, mostly in Brussels. In fact, uh, we did a little calculation, and it turns out I've spent more time in Brussels than any other city other than Washington, D.C., and that's no coincidence. It's because NATO is there, of course, our friends of the European Union uh, as well. Uh, but it has been a center of our engagement, a center of our activity, uh, and uh, that's been made uh, all the better by the exceptional partnership that we have with uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg uh, and NATO. I uh, join people across Europe and indeed around the world in being grateful to the Secretary General for his strong and steady leadership during such a consequential period for the Alliance uh, and for the world. And we're very, very glad that he agreed to extend his tenure uh, through next fall. Uh, today's meeting was an opportunity for us to touch base on the upcoming NATO summit, uh, which will take place in Madrid, as you know, in just a few weeks' time. There, the Alliance will adopt a new strategic concept, the first one since 2010, to make sure that we're ready to meet the challenges of today and the challenges that we anticipate for tomorrow. That includes everything from malicious activity occurring in cyberspace, People's Republic of China's rapid militarization, its no limits friendship with Russia, and efforts to weaken the rules based international order that is <coughs> the foundation for peace and security around the world. And of course, the security implications of climate change, uh, which are profound. We'll strengthen our relationships with the European Union uh, and with partners in the Indo Pacific. We will bolster NATO's budget, and we will renew our alliance's defense and deterrence capabilities. Of course, the chief concept will reflect what we are now dealing with, and that is a new security landscape in Europe and President Putin's decision to launch a senseless war of aggression on Ukraine, now in its fourth month. People of Ukraine continue to fight with extraordinary courage and skill and with military, humanitarian, and financial support from the United States and countries around the world, including virtually all of the members of NATO. Just this morning, President Biden announced a significant new security assistance package to arm Ukraine with additional capabilities and advanced weaponry, precisely what they need to defend themselves against the ongoing Russian aggression. That includes more advanced rocket systems so that they can strike key targets on the battlefield in Ukraine from longer distances. This is a continuation of a strategy that began even before Russia's invasion. We've moved quickly to send Ukraine significant amounts of weapons and ammunition so that they can repel Russia's aggression and, in turn, can be in the strongest possible position at any negotiating table that may emerge. This isn't only the commitment of the United States. As I said, all NATO allies remain engaged, aligned, committed to ensuring that Ukraine can protect its sovereignty, its democracy, its independence. Our countries, along with other partners, imposed severe consequences on the Russian government and its enablers with unprecedented sanctions, export controls, and diplomatic pressure. Together, we've responded to the humanitarian crisis provoked by Russia's war of aggression. More than six million Ukrainians forced to leave their homeland, many others displaced within Ukraine. Countries across Europe and beyond, including the United States, have welcomed Ukrainians fleeing the violence. And countries worldwide are helping provide essential services to communities close to Ukraine that have taken on the most refugees. President Putin hoped that his war on Ukraine would divide NATO. Instead, he's united NATO in support of Ukraine and in defense of its own members. He's brought countries around the world together to support the fundamental principles of sovereignty and independence. They see what's happening in Ukraine as a direct result, uh, excuse me, a direct assault on the foundation of their own peace and security. That is why we will continue to stand with a democratic, independent, sovereign Ukraine until this terrible war is over, and for that matter, long after. NATO will be prepared to face challenges like these <coughs> with secure cyber defenses, cutting edge technology, enhanced partnerships, as I said, with countries uh, around the world. We'll make sure that we defend every inch of NATO territory. The Allies have reinforced our collective defense posture since the war began. We've deployed more than 20,000 additional troops to NATO's eastern flank. 
Many allies are also increasing their military presence in Eastern and Southeastern Europe. Last month, Finland and Sweden, two long-standing partners of NATO, made the decision to seek NATO membership. As President Biden has said, this decision was a victory for democracy. Finland and Sweden are seeking to join NATO not because their leaders forced it, but because their citizens demanded it. Anyone who wonders the difference between a democracy and an authoritarian state like Russia uh, need only look at Russia, Finland, and Sweden. One would lie to its people to wage a war. Two would listen to their people <coughs> to prevent war. The United States strongly supports Finland and Sweden's applications. Both countries are more than qualified uh, to become full members of the alliance as soon as possible. By joining NATO, they will strengthen NATO. We look forward to quickly bringing them into the strongest defensive alliance in history. While Finland and Sweden's applications for NATO membership are being considered, the United States will continue our close partnership with both countries. We'll remain vigilant against any threats to our shared security. We will deter and, as necessary, confront aggression or the threat of aggression. Jens, uh, thank you again for making this visit to Washington at an important moment as we prepare for the summit. Very much looking forward to seeing you next time in a few weeks in Madrid and to the even stronger and more resilient NATO that our summit will help to shape. Thank you and welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Secretary Blinken, dear uh, Tony. It's great to see you again. Uh, and uh, thank you for your strong personal engagement for our transatlantic uh, bond in this uh, pivotal time for our uh, security. And uh, this is very much reflected in uh, your uh, uh, frequent visits to Brussels. Uh, you are welcome back there again. But uh, now I really appreciate this opportunity to meet with you here uh, in uh, Washington. The United States um, is playing an indispensable role in our response uh, to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And let me commend the United States for your very significant support to Ukraine, which is making a difference on the battlefield every day. I also welcome the latest uh, package of military assistance um, announced by President Biden this morning. This is a demonstration of real U.S. leadership. The strong support provided by NATO and allies helps ensure that President Putin's brutal aggression is not rewarded and that Ukraine prevails. At the same time, we must prevent the conflict from escalating. So we have increased our presence in the eastern part of the alliance to remove any room for miscalculation in Moscow about uh, NATO's readiness and determination to defend and protect all NATO allies. And let me thank the United States for increasing your military presence across Europe uh, with over 100,000 troops backed by significant air and naval power. European allies and Canada are also stepping up with more troops, higher readiness, and increased uh, defense spending. For the seventh consecutive year, defense spending has increased. And more and more allies are meeting our guideline of spending 2% of GDP on defense. President Putin wanted less NATO. He is getting more NATO, more troops, and more NATO members. The decisions by Finland and Sweden to apply for NATO membership are historic, and they will strengthen our alliance. We have to address the security concerns of all allies, and I'm confident that we will find a united way forward. To this end, I'm in close contact with President Erdogan of Turkey and with the leaders of Finland and Sweden, and I will convene senior officials from all three countries in Brussels in the coming days. Today, we also discussed uh, the important decisions we will take at the NATO summit in Madrid later this month. We will agree NATO's next strategic concept, to strengthen our deterrence and defense, and prepare for an age of increased strategic competition with authoritarian powers like Russia, and China. This includes working even more closely 
with our partners in the Asia-Pacific and other like-minded partners around the world. We will also review progress uh, on burden sharing. We must continue to invest in our defence and to invest in NATO. Because only North America and Europe, working together in a strong NATO, can keep our one billion people safe in a more dangerous world. So, Secretary Brinkley, there, Tony, once again, thank you so much. Thank you, Hans. We'll now turn to questions, taking two <coughs> from each delegation. We'll start with Vivian Salama of the Wall Street Journal. Thanks, Ned. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Secretary Blinken, uh, two quick questions, please. Uh, with regard to the long-range weapons, what can be done or is being done to minimize escalation with Russia? And do you believe that there's an understanding in Moscow about the nuance that the U.S. is trying to achieve with regard to the, cert the weapons that it does choose to uh, send to Ukraine? And unrelated on um, President Erdogan's latest threats of force to Syria, are you concerned that Turkey is increasingly becoming a disruptive ally and how can it be addressed? Shall I ask my question to Secretary strong. General? Welcome back, sir. Uh, two questions for you as well. Cracks are appearing in the Western Front against Moscow, despite the, both of you stating that uh, the alliance is very strong. And we're seeing that there is some disagreement over uh, shipping more powerful weapons to Ukraine. How does NATO, as an organization, work to prevent the cooperation from going south at Ukraine's expense? And more specifically, how does Ukraine win, which seems to be a key point in this disagreement? Thank you. Thanks. I'm happy to start. Uh, Vivian, thanks for the questions. Um, first, in response to the, uh, the question about escalation, uh, let's start with this. It's Russia that is attacking Ukraine, not the other way around. Uh, and simply put, uh, the, the best way to avoid escalation is for Russia to stop the aggression and the war that it started. It's fully within its uh, power to do so. Um, specifically with regard to weapon systems being provided. The Ukrainians have given us assurances that uh, they will not use these systems against targets on Russian territory. Uh, there is a strong trust bond between Ukraine and the United States, as well as with uh, our allies and partners. I'd also uh, say that throughout this um, aggression, indeed even before, President Biden was very clear with President Putin about what the United States would do if Russia proceeded with its aggression, uh, including continuing to provide security assistance that Ukraine needs to defend itself against the Russian aggression. Uh, there was no, no hiding the ball. We've been extremely clear about this from day one, with President Biden communicating that directly uh, to President Putin. So we have done exactly what we said we would do. Um, and it is Russia, again, that chose to launch this aggression, despite all of our efforts to prevent that, uh, with intense diplomacy over many months. Uh, Again, they started the conflict. Uh, they can end it at any time. Uh, and uh, we will avoid any concerns about miscalculations or escalation. Um, with regard to um, the other theater that you referenced, um, any escalation uh, there in northern Syria um, is something that uh, we, uh, we would oppose. And we support the maintenance of the current ceasefire lines. The concern that we have is that any new offensive would undermine regional stability, such as it is, provide malign actors with um, opportunities to exploit instability for their own purpose. We continue um, effectively to take uh, the fight through partners uh, to, uh, to Daesh, to ISIS uh, within Syria, and uh, we don't want to see anything that jeopardizes the uh, efforts that are made to continue to keep ISIS in the box that we put it in. And let me just also, if I could, before I turn it over to Jens, I do want to say one thing about the question that you addressed the Secretary General. Here again, at every stage of um, this um, Russian aggression, before the aggression, when it started, and in the months since, at virtually every stage we've heard doubts expressed about uh, what the alliance would do, um, what countries would do in terms of support for Ukraine, uh, and whether that was actually going to happen. We've demonstrated that, uh, that it that it would and that it has. Uh, concerns and doubts about uh, whether we could really deliver on what we said we would do, massive consequences uh, for Russia's aggression with unprecedented sanctions. Well, we've delivered on that. Uh, and I would suggest that um, there are always going to be stories about 
differences in any particular moment, but when it comes to the strategic direction that we have taken together <clears throat> as allies, as partners, both within Europe and beyond, uh, this, at least in my experience, has been unprecedented in its solidarity, in the common determination, both to support Ukraine with security assistance, economic assistance, humanitarian assistance, to put extraordinary pressure on Russia to cease its aggression, and to shore up the defenses uh, of our alliance. Uh, and so, again, uh, I'd invite you to go back, look at the questions that were raised starting last fall. They've been answered. <laughs> then again, uh, when Russia committed the aggression in the first place, and even to this day. And I'm very confident that the common purpose that we've shown over many months will continue. I can just follow up on uh, that, because what we have seen over the last uh, months is an unprecedented level of unity among NATO allies and partners in the response to Russia's uh, aggressive uh, uh, war against uh, Ukraine. Uh, we have seen that when it comes to the, uh, the, uh, the provision of uh, military support, uh, humanitarian support, economic support, but also um, uh, the, in the way we have seen uh, uh, NATO allies, partners, the European Union, uh, implementing um, heavy economic sanctions, sanctions we have not seen anything uh, similar to uh, 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 imposed on any major uh, country uh, ever before. Uh, so actually what we have seen is an unprecedented level of uh, unity um, among NATO allies and, uh, and uh, partners. Uh, of course, these are difficult decisions, hard decisions, and uh, therefore there is a need for consultations. And therefore I would also like to commend the United States for consulting so closely with allies. Uh, not only after the invasion uh, on the 24th of February, but actually before. The United States consulted closely, uh, Secretary Blinken consulted closely with NATO allies throughout the autumn. We warned, we shared intelligence. It's hardly any other military invasion that has been more predicted than this one. And that's not least because the United States shared so much uh, intelligence uh, with uh, NATO allies uh, uh, in the months leading up to the invasion in, uh, in February. Um, European allies, um, of course, uh, as the United States, have imposed uh, sanctions. They have a price, also for us. Uh, they are hosting millions of refugees. Uh, but uh, the alternative not to support Ukraine, that will actually enable uh, President Putin to win. Uh, that will be dangerous for all of us, and the price we have to pay will actually be higher than to now invest in uh, the support for uh, Ukraine. Um, let me end by saying that President Putin made a strategic mistake. He totally underestimated the strength and the will and the ability of the Ukrainian people, the Ukrainian armed forces, to defend themselves and he underestimated the unity of NATO and NATO allies and partners uh, to support Ukraine. And again, what we see is U.S. leadership uh, helping uh, this to happen, uh, both on the political, diplomatic level, but also when it comes to organizing um, uh, and coordinating the military support uh, through the uh, support group for uh, Ukraine. On the last question, I would just say that wars are unpredictable. We were able to predict the invasion, but how this war will evolve, it's very hard to predict. What we do know is that almost all wars end at some stage at the negotiating table. And this has also been clearly stated by President Zelensky that at some stage this will end at the negotiating table. But what happens there at the negotiating table is of course totally dependent on the strength, uh, the situation on the battlefield. And that's what we do, we support them in upholding the right for self-defense, and then I have trust and I have confidence uh, in the political leadership in Ukraine that they can make the hard uh, judgments, uh, judgments and, uh, and, uh, and decisions on uh, negotiations uh, and what uh, to agree to uh, when negotiations at some point will start. Tova Biorgas of NRK Norway. Thank you. I have one question for each. Uh, uh, Secretary Blinken, uh, do you think it's possible to deter Russia with weapons at this point, and how far will the U.S. Uh, go? Uh, and for uh, Secretary Stoltenberg, uh, 
we hear about uh, nuclear exercises on the Russian side. What uh, scenarios are you planning for in, in, in terms of, of the nuclear threat from Russia at this point in this war? Thank you. Um, I would say that it's not so much a question of deterring Russia at this point because they have committed the aggression uh, and they're pursuing it. Um, what we are working to do, and the Secretary General said this very eloquently, is to make sure that the Ukrainians have in hand what they need to defend against this aggression, uh, to repel it, uh, to push it back, and as well, uh, and as a result, to make sure that they have the strongest possible hand at any negotiating table that emerges. And I agree with the Secretary General that eventually uh, that is what is likely to happen. We can't say when. Uh, we can't say exactly how. What we can say is what we will do to make sure that Ukraine has the means to defend itself and has the strongest possible hand. At every step along the way, we have evaluated what we believe uh, Ukraine needs to, to do just that, to defend itself effectively. And of course, that's changed through the course of this aggression. What they needed to deal with the threats to Kyiv are very different from what they need to deal with what's now happening in uh, southern and, and eastern uh, Ukraine. So we've adjusted as this has gone along in terms of what we and other allies and partners are providing to the Ukrainians. We'll continue to do that as we go forward. Um, again, it is fully within Russia's power to stop what they started uh, and uh, to end the aggression. That's what uh, we seek. Uh, but as long as this goes on, we will support the Ukrainians and make sure that they have what they need to defend themselves effectively. NATO and NATO allies are, of course, monitoring very uh, closely uh, what Russia uh, does, uh, including their nuclear exercises. And uh, we have also uh, followed very closely the uh, nuclear uh, uh, rhetoric that uh, uh, President Putin and other uh, Russian leaders has, uh, have expressed over the last uh, months. Uh, this uh, nuclear saber rattling rhetoric is dangerous, um, and uh, it is uh, something that is only uh, increasing uh, tensions. At the same time, um, we have not seen any changes in Russia's nuclear posture. Uh, and um, uh, we also remind Russia on the fact that actually as late as uh, in January, they agreed in the UN a statement where they stated clearly that the nuclear uh, war cannot be won and should not be fought. Um, so, uh, Russia knows that any use of nuclear weapons would totally change the nature of a conflict, and therefore uh, uh, nuclear weapons should not be used. Kylie Atwood of CNN. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, Secretary Blinken, two questions for you. First, on the food crisis that is um, growing deeper because of the war, is there any way to get the 20 million plus uh, tons of grain that are stuck in Odessa right now out of the country without Russia allowing those Ukrainian ships uh, to move? And what will be the cost for Russia if they don't allow those ships to move? We know that the United States is working on overland solutions here, but what is the cost for Russia if they don't allow the sea routes to open? Um, and then the second question is about the timeline here. We've heard Biden administration officials talking about this conflict turning into a drawn out conflict. It's likely to go on for months. But with Russia making these gains in the East now, what is the outlook? Do you see this conflict going into next year without a resolution? And then um, NATO Secretary General, uh, you mentioned that you're going to convene leaders of, speed, of Finland, Sweden, and Turkey in the coming days. So I'm wondering if you are expecting Sweden and Finland to come to the table with precise actions they are willing to take <coughs> that could assuage Turkey's concerns. And I'm also wondering if you're confident that Turkey's concerns about their membership uh, will be addressed this month before the G7 summit. Thank you. Kali, thanks very much. Uh, with regard to the food situation, um, a couple of things. First, uh, we are dealing with what is um, a global food insecurity uh, challenge and, and, and even crisis. Uh, Pre-existing conditions, COVID, um, climate, and now conflict. All of these together have helped create a perfect storm where 
food, particularly from some of the breadbaskets for the world, Ukraine, Russia itself, um, are not available because of Russia's aggression. Uh, and as a result as well, prices have gone up for the food that is available. And we had a situation where a couple of years ago there were roughly uh, 100 million people who were food insecure around the world. Before the Russian aggression over the last couple of years, that's gone up to about 160 million. Now an additional 40 million people uh, by uh, expert accounts are likely to be uh, food insecure uh, as a result directly of the, the Russian aggression. Because to your point, what's happening is this. There are roughly 20 to 25 million tons um, of uh, grain that are sitting in silos near Russian <coughs> uh, Ukrainian ports in Odessa that can't even be moved to ships, in part because there are ships at the Odessa port, about 85 of them, full of this uh, grain and wheat that can't move because of the Russian uh, effective blockade of the ports. So uh, the United Nations has been working, uh, and Secretary General, I applaud his efforts to uh, see if he can find uh, a way forward on this to allow the ships out to end this uh, blockade. That work continues. At the same time, we're looking at every other possible uh, route to get uh, wheat, grains, other things out of Ukraine and onto world markets. All of that work is ongoing. In terms of what Russia risks, well, I would start with what's left of its reputation. Um, it seeks relationships with countries around the world, including many countries that are now the victim of uh, Russian aggression because of growing food insecurity resulting from that aggression. Uh, we uh, were in New York about 10 days ago. We had the presidency, as you know, of the Security Council for the month of May. Uh, I focused our efforts on the food insecurity challenges that are being faced around the world. And many countries pointed out uh, that a big part of this is the Russian aggression and the fact that food can't get out uh, of Ukraine to where it's needed. So I think there's a growing recognition of countries around the world that the challenges that they're facing now, compounded by conflict, uh, compounded by Russia's aggression, are due to what Russia uh, is doing. Uh, I'd point out again that to those who are concerned that the sanctions we've imposed on Russia are somehow impeding the delivery of food, that is simply not true. Uh, the sanctions have exemptions for food, um, and uh, including services necessary to make sure that food moves, like banking services. We have a, we've had a, one of our senior officials uh, go around the world to make that very clear to, uh, to other countries and to uh, help them with any questions they may have. This is on Russia. And regardless of anything else, you would think the least that the Russians would do would be to make sure that other countries are not suffering from their aggression, despite the suffering they're imposing on the Ukrainians. With regard to timelines, um, Secretary General said it well. We, we can't predict um, how this is going to play out, when this is going to play out. Uh, as best we can assess right now, um, we are still looking at many months of conflict. Again, that could be over tomorrow if Russia chose to end the aggression. We don't see any signs of that right now. But it's a moving picture, as the Secretary General said. That's by definition what uh, wars are. Um, and I'll just repeat what I said. Uh, as long as this goes on, we want to make sure that Ukraine has in hand what it needs to defend itself. And we want to make sure that Russia is feeling strong pressure from uh, as many countries as possible to end the aggression. That's the best way, we think, uh, to bring the aggression to uh, a close as soon as possible, to end the war, uh, to get to diplomacy, uh, and to stop the suffering. On Finland and Sweden, uh, I and my staff, we are in close uh, contact, of course, with, uh, with Turkey, uh, an important NATO ally, and uh, the two uh, countries that have uh, applied for NATO membership, uh, Finland and uh, Sweden, uh, we have uh, uh, met with them and I'm going to convene a meeting uh, in a few days uh, with senior officials and then follow up uh, to ensure that we make progress uh, on uh, the applications of Finland and Sweden to uh, join uh, NATO. Uh, my intention is to have this in place uh, before the NATO summit. Uh, at the same time, I know that to, uh, to make progress we need uh, 30 allies uh, to uh, agree. Um, Finland and Sweden has made it, have made it clear that they are ready to sit down um, and to address uh, the concerns uh, expressed by uh, uh, Turkey. Uh, and all NATO allies are, of course, ready to sit down and uh, address those concerns, including the threats uh, posed to Turkey by PKK. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this is uh, terrorist threats, which, uh, of course, uh, is something we are taking very seriously. We know that. 
no other NATO ally uh, have, uh, has, uh, have, have suffered more terrorist attacks than, than, uh, than Turkey. And, um, and uh, Turkey is an important ally, uh, not least because of it, uh, its strategic geographic uh, location bordering Iraq and Syria. They have been uh, important in our fight against ISIS and also a Black Sea uh, country uh, close to Russia. So all of this makes uh, Turkey an important ally. When they raise uh, concerns, of course, we sit down and we look into how we can find the united way uh, forward. We'll take a final question from Stefan Asberg of SVT Sweden. Uh, Secretary Blinken, two questions. Uh, specifically, what is the US willing to do to facilitate the negotiations between Turkey, Sweden, and Finland? Were there two questions? Please uh, go I ahead. can only ask one at a time. <laughs> one at a time, OK. Thank you. Um, you've heard uh, from the Secretary General. Um, Finland and Sweden are working directly with Turkey. Uh, NATO is supporting this effort. The Secretary General uh, will bring uh, the, the parties together. We very much uh, support those efforts. Um, there is a strong consensus uh, within NATO uh, broadly for the rapid accession of, uh, of Sweden uh, and Finland to the alliance. I remain very confident that uh, that will happen, that we're going to move forward. As I've said before, uh, this is a process, and in that process, if allies have concerns, they raise them, and then uh, we deal with them. Uh, NATO is, is dealing with them, but in particular, concerns that Turkey has raised uh, directly with, uh, with Finland and, and Sweden are being addressed uh, by the Finns and the Swedes with the uh, assistance of NATO. We want to make sure that all allies have their security concerns taken into account, and that, of course, includes Turkey. But I'm confident this process will move forward. Are you as willing to export fighter jets to Turkey, for instance, to easen up the situation? These are, th these are separate questions. We have a longstanding and ongoing uh, defense relationship with, uh, with Turkey uh, as, a, as a NATO ally. And as we have in the past, uh, as we're doing now, as we will in the future, we'll continue to work through uh, cases as they, as they arise uh, with regard to uh, systems that Turkey seeks to acquire. And Secretary Stoltenberg, how confident are you that uh, Turkey will approve Sweden and Finland? I'm confident that we will find a way uh, forward. Uh, and uh, I am confident because uh, all allies agree that NATO enlargement has been a great success, helping to uh, spread uh, democracy, freedom across uh, Europe for uh, decades. Um, and uh, therefore, we need to sit down, as we always do when there are different, uh, different views in NATO, uh, and find uh, a way to go uh, forward together. Uh, so this is not the first time in NATO that uh, some allies express concerns that there are some differences, some disagreements. But we have a, a long track record in NATO also to be able to overcome those differences and then agree uh, on how to move forward. Okay. That concludes the press conference. Thank you, Thanks, everyone. everyone. Thank you.